this is the Easter Easter weekend. So this is the this is the most important if you, for a Christian for Christians. This is the the central point of the year. The big this is the big holiday, the big festival, uh, because this is the triumph of 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 Jesus over death. This is this is the big one. He's crucified on the Friday, and then on the third day after, he rises again. So death is defeated once and for all. So it's it's a freedom. It's freedom for 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 humanity from from all the tribulations of sin and death and all the rest of it. That's it's that's gone. So this is the big one for for Christianity. It's also Passover uh, for the Jewish uh, faith. I think I'm not sure, but I think it's the only time where these I think these two festivals every year uh, they're always together. You know how Easter moves around a bit, depending on how it has to be calculated every year? Well, it's always with Passover. They're, t- they're together like t- two dancers in a waltz. You know, they've each got something slightly different to do, but they're always together. And Passover is much older, obviously, than Easter. And that goes back to the Old Testament story of Moses asking Pharaoh to free the people, free the Israelites and let them let my people go and, and go home. And he won't. And there's a, there's a, car, there's a dreadful... Uh, event that happens three times in a row plague and blood and locusts and all the rest of it until Pharaoh lets the people go they have the Passover meal because the last one is um, the firstborn children of, of Egypt all die but the but, but the, 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 the avenging angel passes over the, the Jewish people they're passed over, they're left alone and then when they have, they have to leave in such a hurry because Pharaoh, when he finally when his resolve breaks, he can't see the back of them fast enough and they have to go so quickly that they, they're bred doesn't have time to rise, so it's it's flat bread that they take with them uh, for the for the trip, and so so the Passover is all about uh, uh, eating unleavened bread and drinking wine in in commemoration of this time when they were when they were passed over and, and set free. So it's freedom as well for the Jewish faith. So I'm going on a bit there, but I, I was just thinking about freedom while I was away, and and in a, in a much more prosaic sense when I when I when I was away, and it, it, I was thinking about. Uh, Net zero, from from Easter to net zero. What a segue! Um, but we were in our old car. We've got a seventeen-year-old uh, Chrysler Grand Voyager. The, the letters, the letters are coming off the back one by one. Um, it's you know the in the Star Trek movie, V'ger is the is that spaceship thing that's coming back that's threatening destruction. Our our Voyager <laughs> is becoming V'ger. It's great, uh, but it's seventeen years old. It's an old diesel car. And it's still it's still going strong, and I was thinking about how we were able to just shoot off into the wilds of Scotland, without a care in the world, because you know there's filling stations all over, and so you've got no stress. You can you know you can you can keep getting fuel, and I was thinking, imagine if you were up here in an electric vehicle, because it's all it's all well and good, I suppose, if you're down in urbanised areas, maybe the central belt of Scotland or or down in London or whatever where you've got the best chance of, of moving from charging point to charging point. But it's not like that in the Highlands of Scotland. And it's it's very hard to imagine a time when it will be any better in the Highlands of Scotland. And I was I kept on saying to my son, imagine if we were if we were up here in a Tesla or something or, or some other 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 brands of electric vehicle are available for and uh, what would it be like if we had all, if we had the added anxiety of wondering where we were going to get to power next? And we were we were staying when we were on Sky. We were in this really quite remote location. We'd, we'd rented a wee apartment, and uh, you know the very idea of being there and and having some sort of problem getting your electric vehicle charged. I thought so. Basically, I was thinking if they if they persevere with this net zero, uh, you know, s- s- uh, self pen suicide note, uh, where everyone gives surrenders all forms of of uh, of carbon based energy. Uh, and obviously, you know, in Scotland, there's no no prospect at all of nuclear power. So if we sign up to this future where there's nothing but wind and solar to provide the electricity that would be required for all the people to charge their vehicles, to power their homes, uh, to power their ground and air source heat pumps that will have to do all the, the job of, you know, gas boilers and, and oil fired central heating systems and, and all the rest of it. I thought life will never be the same again in the Highlands of Scotland, in other places too. But I was, this is my country, and this is, I was looking out at what I could see would be the reality. 
for the for the millions of people living in Scotland, and that you know the the those that that live in the more remote areas and out in the islands, out in the Western Isles, out in the Outer Hebrides and whatever, you know, where they're dependent on on ferries that that are powered by diesel that, to get them back and forth to the mainland, and and you know during the winter months and whatever, where when the weather really sets in, I think of what what will it be like for them when they're entirely dependent on this electricity that apparently is going to be generated always and only by wind and solar. In the winter, when there is no solar, and often in the, in the winter time, and there's no wind. And I was... So so we, there's, there's Teddy and I uh, travelling about with the absolute epitome of freedom, you know, father and son, and we were just... We, we were able to go wherever we wanted. We just went where we went on a whim. Um, and it was easy. It was so liberating to have that sense of freedom. And I thought, people are being sold, they're being gulled into thinking that the the life they have now, uh, powered by whatever, fossil fuels, is going to be replaced with the same again, but powered by electricity. And you spend two or three days up in the highlands of Scotland and you realise that is simply not going to happen. That, that infrastructure is not going to be there. And that's why the the flip side of of all the the you know electric vehicle renewable energy carry on are the fifteen minute cities, because it's quite plain that what the future really holds for people is being stuck within walking distance or push bike distance of their houses. That's that's the reality that's coming down the line. Now, if you live in London or Manchester or Glasgow or whatever, then you might say that there was a realistic possibility of uh, living on foot and by push bike and by electric buses. W- w- maybe, maybe. But if you live on Sky, or if you live at Balahulish, or if you live in Glencoe Village, or, or, or any of these places up in the Western Highlands, your life, I don't know, I don't know what your life is going to look like, but whatever your life is now, you're not going to continue with that in the net zero future. It's simply not going to happen. There's not going to be the infrastructure to charge everyone's electric vehicle and to heat everyone's home with a ground source or an air source heat pump. And you're not going to be going to school in an electric bus. It's simply not It's simply not going to happen. It's not realistic. And so you, what you have to do is pay attention to the fact that what's coming down the line are smaller, limited lives, colder. That is what's coming. And you know, so I was, I was thinking, I was thinking about that, especially as I realised when I, especially when I woke up this morning, and I thought it was Good Friday, and as I said at the top, you know, Easter, Easter is all about freedom. It, it, it's freedom from death for for Christianity, and it's and it's the remembrance of freedom from bondage for the for the Jewish faith. And I thought, what a time to be thinking about the about what freedom actually means, um, because what you're reminded of with Easter and what you're reminded of at Passover is that freedom is a right but that rights are not always free. I think that's it in a nutshell. Freedom is a right but rights are not always free. And we've we've reached a fork in the road where we're going to have to decide if we're going to be free or not. And Good Friday and and Easter Monday are, are times to remember that freedom is secured with sacrifice. From time to time, you have to go through something dreadful to get to where you want to be, to get to the sunlit uplands. Easter's a reminder of that, of sacrifice, and that freedom is a right, but rights are not always free. And that's what I was thinking about. So as I was was hurtling around the highlands of Scotland, and it was stunning. We came through every kind of weather, as you always do up there, four seasons in one day and all that. Sunlight, the one minute, cloud down at your knees, the next, rain, whatever, wind blowing, and then the sun comes back. And if, if, so every five minutes you're looking out at a whole new world, because it just changes continually. And I was looking at that, and I was looking at my son and thinking that he's entitled to the to the life that I have had. He's entitled to the freedoms that I have enjoyed. And we're at that fork in the road, and there's going to have to be a fight for some of that freedom. It's pure and simple. You would think the powers that be would want to preserve freedoms and extend freedoms, but it's odd that it seems to go the other way. It's absolutely the other way. It's absolutely the other way. It's very interesting for for everyone in uh, in the United Kingdom at the moment because we're looking down the barrel of the coronation of King Charles III, 
and he's going to take a coronation oath. Right, now, we haven't heard a coronation oath since his since his mother did it seventy odd years ago. So as yet, we don't know what the content of that coronation oath is going to be. I don't know if there's any plan to let us hear that in advance. Are they going to put that out as a press release so that we know, or are we just going to have to wait and hear what he says? Um, but in principle, the coronation oath, which is something that constitutional monarchs or kings of 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 Britain have been saying for a thousand years. Um, He is expected to stand up and say that he will defend the freedoms and liberties of sovereign people living in a sovereign nation. He's the first sovereign, right? He's he's first among equals. He's the first sovereign, but we're all sovereign individuals living in a sovereign nation. And we're supposed to be protected. Our liberties uh, were to be protected by the by the overlordship of foreign powers. All of that is somehow supposed to be folded into his coronation oath. And it's going to be very interesting to see that. But you know the, so the, the point is, yes, as you say, you would you would expect, perhaps in your naivety, that the powers that be are there to protect our liberties. Because that's what they say. That's what they say they're going to do. What Prime Ministers and the rest of the Popinjays periodically stand behind podiums and talk about freedom and liber- liberty. But let's see what they actually do. What people say is one thing, but ju- you judge people by their actions. And we are supposed to be free people. But the very opposite seems to be coming down the line. Net zero, net zero is, a, is a trick that's being pulled because it has within it all of the mechanisms that are required to take away our freedoms. Freedom of movement. That you turn around, by the time you get ready to protest about this, you'll find out that they've legislated against the freedom to protest. They'll have, they'll have marginalised freedom of speech and dissent. You know, by the time people waken up to the point where they want to speak out and act out about wanting their freedoms, a lot of that will have been legislated away. And then will come another question, because just because the powers that be legislate, which is to say, just because they draft and enact legislation does not make it lawful. There's a difference between legal, which is legislation, which is what they pass through the House of Commons and the House of Lords and and then enact on the statute book. There's a difference between that and what is actually lawful. Lawful comes from the common law and natural law. It's the difference between right and wrong. And people need to waken up to the fact that just because a a sitting government or or a parliament passes legislation does not make that legislation lawful. Quite often, quite the contrary. From time to time, powers that be go bad, go wrong, and they start legislating against the people and against freedom. Now, that's unlawful. There comes a time when the only moral action by people that know the difference between good and bad, right and wrong, is to stand up and say no. Just because it's the legislation doesn't make it lawful. And that's all coming down the line at us under the guise of net zero and 15-minute cities and all of the rest of it. These are, these are tricks to, by sleight of hand to take away our liberties and our freedoms. But at any point, it only takes enough of us to stand up and say no. We know the difference between right and wrong and we are free people. If the people decide that collectively that we are not to be governed, that we are ungovernable, then there's nothing that the powers that be can do about it. One way or another, we have to be governed by consent. And the moment enough of us take away our consent, the game's a bogey and all bets are off. And it's coming down the line.